everyone, and welcome to LEAD, Leading Equity and Diversity. I'm Debbie Willis, pronouns she, her, hers, and I lead the DEI Certificate Program at Rackham Graduate School. We want to thank all of our guests joining us today, and all of us as panelists and hosts want to really thank you for being here at a time that is so much things going on in the world and it's a particularly hard time for marginalized communities um, this week in particular. So we really appreciate you being here. We want you all to know that your videos and audio has been muted for quality of the recording as you were prompted, it was recording. Um, but we encourage you to engage in the conversation through the question and answer portal because we love to bring your voices in and hear your voices. If you see a question that you'd like to hear the response to, please like that question because we allow the upvote and we'll ask the questions with the broadest interest first. We started this series because the community that we heard from wanted to hear from real people, um, their experiences leading equity, diversity, and social justice efforts. Our featured guest today that I'm really excited about is um, representatives from the U of M Task Force Against AAPI Hate, Amanda Lowe and Steve Lynn. Amanda, we agreed to start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to leadership in this role? Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, Steve and I are both really excited to be here. And as you mentioned, um, you know, we really appreciate that folks are tuning in, especially in a really difficult time for marginalized communities. So we know that engaging in this work can be really challenging. So thank you for showing up during a hard week. Um, so as Deborah mentioned, my name is Amanda Lowe. My pronouns are she and hers. I am the Associate Director for the Michigan Research and Discovery Scholars. Um, and I'll let my colleague Steve also introduce himself too. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Lynn. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Assistant Director for the First Year Experience Office. Great, so our hope today is to talk a little bit about the staff association and the APIA task force that um, exists, as well as to tell you a little bit about our journeys. So I first thought we would start by explaining um, where we're from, right? So I am a member of the core planning team for the APIDA staff association. APIDA stands for the Asian Pacific Islander Daisy slash American staff group. Um, this group was founded in the fall of 2017 by a few of us who realized that there were a number of other staff and faculty groups of, for um, people of color, but there was no space for Asian and Asian American staff. And so we started by just convening a couple of us trying to figure out you know, what we wanted to be. Um, and we had a couple of community meetings. We, we gauged some interest with about 10, 15 people. Um, and now we've really scaled up. And so we have more than a hundred members in our association. Um, we currently work on just staff concerns because we know that another group uh, Indigo exists for um, Asian and uh, Asian American faculty, and there are many uh, student groups that already exist, but there was no space for staff, and staff have very specific needs, and so that's why we exist. Um, our group has four different pillars of work. So interestingly, when we came up with these pillars, we realized that it spelled the acronym of race, so that's what we use. Um, so our first pillar is resources, or providing commu our community with pertinent information for professional development and personal growth. The next one is advocacy, which is mostly at U of M, but lately with the coronavirus um, has focused a little bit more broadly on national issues. Um, community, so building our internal staff community, as well as strengthening bonds with the faculty and student groups on campus. And then education, so educating both ourselves and others on the various differences between our ethnic groups. Um, some of our deliverables over the past couple of years include monthly newsletters to share information, professional development opportunities, events, um, building a coalition with other groups of color, such as Pluma, um, the Women of Color Task Force, and ABFest, um, working with the Vice President of Human Resources to voice staff concerns from our APITA lens, and professional development workshops, such as talking about the bamboo ceiling, um, providing a mentoring program for folks to network across campus, and then social and um, programmatic community building opportunities. And I'll let Steve talk about the task force. Thanks, Amanda. So Amanda talked a little bit about the APIDA Staff Association. Uh, the AAPI um, 
Anti-Asian Hate Task Force is a different organization, grouping of folks, but also include members of the APITA Staff Association. So I just want to make that clear. Um, so amongst the APITA Staff Association, the core team had been noticing and talking with each other about the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes in the national news and in different pockets around the university uh, post-COVID. Um, from our conversation, we were like, well, if we're concerned about this, maybe there's other people in the community that are also concerned about this. And we'll make this the topic and focus of a conversation for one of our monthly staff meetings. Uh, so we had um, a really great turnout at the staff meeting. We saw some new attendees uh, that weren't able to attend in person uh, when we were all on campus. Uh, and after the meeting, one of the members actually messaged us independently about how we can take the conversation that we were having about our individual concerns to the university level. And so through um, this member's uh, interest in doing some more activism on campus around this, uh, one of the core members uh, had uh, built up a coalition of folks that included not only staff, but also students as well as faculty and convened that group to talk about, hey, what are other folks thinking about and experiencing related to this rise in anti-Asian hate that we're seeing and how can we as collectively as faculty, staff and students work together to address this. So we began in um, second week of April. Uh, we've been meeting weekly since then to coordinate and plan what we could do. Uh, so to this date, we organized to partner with university administration uh, on releasing a statement condemning anti-Asian hate and supporting the University of Michigan APETA community, both faculty, staff, and students. Uh, these students uh, spearheaded a project to develop a social media campaign to raise awareness about this issue uh, for the U of M community. Uh, it's been our experience that oftentimes um, anti-Asian hate isn't uh, reported as um, often uh, and so folks don't hear about it. And if they're not aware of it, they don't think it's an issue. And so uh, the students really took um, some great efforts and uh, steps in creating a social media campaign that could help highlight uh, and create an outlet for folks to tell their stories um, if they're not making it to the national media. Uh, and the faculty side, they have spearheaded uh, a number of different research projects connected to this issue. So we do have a faculty member here who uh, is supporting a um, hate crimes uh, reporting um, website and uh, in partnership with a couple different uh, national organizations um, in California. Uh, we're also, they are also uh, leading out uh, exploring media and social media uh, conversation around anti-Asian hate. And so those are some of the projects that we have done as part of the AAPI uh, task force. And so we're continuing to meet and explore other needs for the University of Michigan APITA community and how we might uh, collectively support this work. And so some of the more recent conversations uh, around projects that we could be doing is engaging university leadership, continuing to engage university leadership around APITA concerns during this time, uh, growing the reach of the social media campaign that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, as well as developing new ideas and projects. And so uh, some of the ideas were partnerships with Ann Arbor organizations. So taking uh, the work that we're doing for University of Michigan to the larger Ann Arbor community, uh, seeking out possible connections with uh, area high schools to begin the education and conversation around um, Asian American history, uh, anti-Asian hate, um, and expanding beyond there. So that's a little bit about uh, the AAPI uh, task force. This is phenomenal. It's great to hear that you have faculty, staff, students, administration, and um, even you're involved in the community. It was also good to hear the president yesterday when he was addressing the questions of all the questions I'm sure he received. He did address that question about, about um, hate and how we as a community will not accept it. So that's, that's phenomenal. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're facing now or the challenges that you face in the work that you do with the AAPI task force? Amanda, you want to start? 
Sure. So I'll let Steve answer the part about the task force, but at least oh, okay. our um, planning team, um, you know, when the coronavirus hit, we had all collectively decided that we were going to scale back some of our efforts as a staff association to focus on the new transition to working from home. You know, people have children and personal lives and just trying to balance things. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't do that because of the rise in um, xenophobic and racist behavior. So mm. if anything, we have launched into um, a more intensive, uh, more intensive efforts with our staff association in order to provide support and advocacy for our community members. So it, it uh, was not, did not go as planned. Um, yeah, so I'll let Steve answer the, the piece about the coalition and the... Um, Sure. So related to the task force, one of the challenges uh, is with such a diverse group, I mean, we had both fac we had faculty, staff and students is um, one creating space for all different voices and perspectives to, to be represented um, and also uh, allowing folks to pursue what makes sense in their spheres of influence um, and then figuring out, well, do all these things fit together? Do we need to coordinate or can they exist and we just support each other's pieces? So um, it was an ad hoc group that came together because they had interest in this uh, and, and a passion for it, but figuring out the mechanisms and the structure of the organization and, and that has been a continuing conversation. And so we've gone from being laser focused on, hey, we're gonna focus on our own particular things to uh, transitioning to, to see how we, can now um, function as an organization. We have shifted to um, rotating uh, facilitation amongst the faculty, staff, and students. So each meeting, uh, it rotates through. And so, yeah, moving from the project, growing the organization from focusing on projects to how do we sustain uh, this organization in a way that feels equitable and makes sense for uh, future plans. So that's been a few of the challenges uh, in working with the task force. Yeah, that's great. We, um, collaboration is phenomenal, right? But it's also very complicated and complex. So it's good that you all are like really working together to figure that out with every other population. So that's great to hear. What are some of the things that you're hearing from the either students, faculty, staff? What are some of the things, the specific needs that you're hearing that you're trying to address from your communities? Sure. Any Mind if I jump in first? Go for it. Yeah, so actually yesterday we had another meeting that was focused, again, on this uh, topic of anti-Asian um, hate uh, for the APITA Staff Association. And so we had um, a community of our staff association come together and we had a conversation ar around this. And uh, there's a lot of concern. Um, we had a, a few different polls in terms of uh, trying to gauge what people have experienced in this time. And we had everything from uh, people in the community experiencing microaggressions to outright um, you know, assaults and violence, uh, aggressive behavior from folks. Um, so we're, you know, the community has ex uh, experienced a broad range of things within it, as well as folks who are just concerned about this. We know that this is in the environment, this is in the air, this is in the national conversation right now. Uh, so folks are, are nervous going out grocery shopping. We had a, like a five, 10 minute conversation about all the new steps that we need to take in order to feel safe enough to go out to go grocery shop, strategizing with our partners to say, oh, who should go out? Maybe we should go out together. Maybe it should only be me. Mm -hmm. um, the, the mental calculus it, it takes to, well, you know, I, I need a break from being inside and take a break from my kids and I wanna go for a walk. But I also want to be out and feel safe when I'm walking. Do I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Does that make me a target? What do I do? Um, people in the moment not knowing how to respond. Uh, one of our staff members shared they were walking in their neighborhood, not too far from their own home, and someone was aggressively yelling at them, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And, you know, being struck in the moment, not knowing how to respond um, and what that means for your family, how that impacts your sense of self and, and in the world and what kind of uh, what kind of role modeling does that do for your children. So there's a lot of different uh, concerns that staff had um, brought up in our conversation yesterday. I don't know if Amanda, if you want to share as well. 
Yeah, so one of the ways that we're trying to address that need is by providing resources for folks to feel a little bit safer, right? So whether it is our community gatherings so that people can at least share these things because sometimes it might be hard to feel like you can post this on social media or talk to friends who don't understand. Um, so having that safe space for people to be able to talk about this openly has been really helpful. Um, another thing that we're pushing is this bystander intervention training that's offered by Hollaback. And I am going to butcher the name, but there's another group involved. Um, hey, that, yeah. Um, hey, we'll, we'll send the information. Justice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just blanking on the name right now. But they are providing a bystander intervention training specifically for the APEDA community. And that's been a really great resource as well. Yeah, um, you provided some phenomenal resources and we will definitely send that out to all the registrants and everybody that's on the webinar today. But what does that, have you seen that training specifically or where yeah. might they be able to, is it easily accessible for everybody to get? Yes, it's, for, it's a free hour long training um, that is easily accessible and they're offering multiple sessions in June. Oh, okay. And then that, is there a website? Yeah, I think it is on the resource sheet, but if not, we okay. can it out. Okay, perfect. So that's really helpful to have something like that. When you're also talking about the other things, do you provide like, um, how do you provide a space in COVID-19, basically, when you can't get together and you really can't meet together to go to the grocery store together? Are you providing spaces for people, you said, to just talk about it? Or what's been helpful, you think, in a community? Yeah, so uh, from yesterday's conversation, one of our poll questions was, uh, would you be interested in continuing to have space to continue talking about your experiences in the post-COVID world? Mm -hmm. uh, and overwhelmingly, everybody was interested in continuing to have these spaces. And so uh, the core team will, uh, you know, we'll take some planning, but we'll planning to do some continuing um, opportunities for just staff to get together to talk uh, specifically about, hey, how am I navigating um, the COVID spaces? Um, you know, in addition to uh, the resources mentioned there, um, connecting faculty and staff, uh, well, staff particularly through our newsletter uh, to campus resources, um, counseling, um, to health centers, things of that sort. Uh, and beyond like laser focused on the challenges people are experiencing, also thinking about we also need social space, like just to kind of get together and hang out and not be um, consumed by the worries of the day, right? Uh, and so we've started offering a Netflix party. I don't know if folks are familiar. People are probably familiar with Netflix, but there is a, a Chrome uh, extension that allows folks to sync up and watch shows together on their own separate screens from where they're at and they can chat each other. Uh, so APITA has been offering that on a, a weekly basis, um, opportunities for folks to just kind of get together and let's just watch a sitcom together because, you know, there's, there's enough to be worried about throughout the day. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's another way that we're trying to create space for uh, folks in our community. Great. Did you want to add, Amanda? Nope, I think Steve hit it. Great. So one of the other things that this organization has been incredibly good about is the social media and the coverage and the news and just getting people involved. What advice would you give to people about how to go about doing that? What are some of the methods you use to bring so many communities together? So I think in terms of co um, collecting the news, one of the nice things is that a lot of our core team members subscribe to a lot of different news sites. And so that's how we're able to um, kind of curate a, a pretty large sample of what's going on and then figure out what to disseminate to the staff group. Um, so it helps to have people in different places, right? So um, while we are all staff, we all come from different sp spheres. So Steve and I are more student life and student and academic affairs, but we also have folks on our team who are in the IT space or the DEI space or um, more of the research lens. And so having people from all these different places means that we're able to get info from different uh, pockets. 
So I did want to say to everyone that Mary Rose, thank you, put the bystander intervention training link right into the chat. So for those of you who want to access it immediately, it's right there and we appreciate that. And speaking of Mary, I read the article in the Michigan Daily and um, just reading that and sharing that story that Mary shared and that other people shared um, really helped bring to light what's what's happening and how people are feeling in addition to what you just shared earlier steve can you tell us a little bit more about the michigan daily article how that came about um so from what i know our um the writer like francesca dong uh reached out to the task force um after seeing the letter and mass email that was disseminated by the task force asking for more information and so from there she was able to talk to students, faculty, and staff about their experiences um, because she wanted to be able to capture that um, for a different audience who might not have seen the email. And then is there any other methods or any other things you use that to share those type of stories that people can really connect to? Or do you have any advice or recommendations or suggestions around that? As I mentioned, one of the projects that came out of the task force was the uh, social media campaign. Um, I'll dig for the link to that as well, but uh, it's on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it is capturing the broad range of experiences that people from our community have experienced in this post-COVID world um, related to anti-Asian hate. And so uh, one, you could read a whole broad range of people's experiences and stories from uh, elementary and grade school students, uh, to college students, to uh, professionals. Um, so there's a broad range of stories that you can have access to, as well as um, share your own story. So they're actually um, asking for submissions, uh, just so that we can capture uh, all the different, the range of stories, uh, validate people's experiences, um, whether they are the ones sharing it or reading and um, finding uh, echoes of similar experiences in their own lives. We just want to make space and hold um, these community stories because they're really important. I agree. Um, Mary also put the link to the Michigan Daily article in the chat, which is great. I recommend you read it um, if you haven't been able to do that. And then there was a question about whether the trainings are offered in different languages for those who are non-English speaking and are also very vulnerable, what resources are available to help them feel more safe and protected? That's a good question. Um, I did just do a quick skim of the training that we were advertising. And as far as I know, it's only being offered in English and ASL. But I think that this um, organization has been pretty receptive to feedback and has been adjusting and making tweaks to their training as they've continued to offer it. So I think that's definitely an ask that um, we could present to them. Great, because uh, it was a similar question about that, about whether the ones in June are being offered in different language and if there can be any advocacy around that. Yeah, we can definitely look into it. Um, I don't know that we're specifically connected with the organization offering the training, but like I said, we've seen them already build a second part of the training based on the feedback that they have received. So it seems to make they're pretty open to things. Great. So one of the questions we asked people to submit questions as they registered even, and one of the questions that we have is, how do you build coalitions with other marginalized and minoritized populations? How can we start that conversation? So I think you hit the nail on the head, but just saying it's starting the conversation, right? So when we um, helped to found the coalition that currently exists on campus, um, it was just because our group was new and we wanted to be able to learn from people who have already paved the way. And so we reached out to leadership from the Women of Color Task Force, from ABFAS, from Pluma, and just said, you know, we're really curious to learn how you got started, what your goals are, like, do we have any mm. common themes? And so it was just a sit down meeting. And through all of those meetings, we understood that there was a theme of interest of, in connecting. And so that's what helped bring us together. So I think it's just a matter of reaching out and starting the conversation of saying like, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say, like, do we have any common goals? Let's get together. 
Did you want to add anything, Steve? I think Amanda captured it. Okay. Is there anything that the um, task force or the Asian American community, knowing that, yes, your goals are specific to Asian Americans, but with everything going on in the world with African Americans and other minorities, is there anything, any conversation you're having about that? Yeah, so this is something that our core team talked about a lot um, in our planning meeting this week, that we recognize that there's a lot of other things happening to marginalized communities, and it is really important for us to be able to like show up and support in ways that we can. So currently, um, our newsletter comes out the first Tuesday of every month, so next Tuesday, and we're currently like curating articles about um, anti-Blackness in the Asian community and why that's a problem, as well as Asian and Black allyhood strategies to be able to disseminate to a, our community. Wow, that's phenomenal. You said that you would put it in the newsletter? Yeah, so we send out a newsletter to our staff every month and so with different um, articles and resources and professional development opportunities. And so we have a number of things in that space for people to engage with. Great. And so how could everybody get on the listserv for the newsletter? So the newsletter is currently for folks who identify as a PETA and staff, but if they are interested, we can put um, our contact information in the chat as well, and they can just email us and be added to the listserv. And the listserv is open for everyone? Um, so sorry, the listserv and the newsletter are open to folks who identify as Asian, Pacific Islander, DC American. So it is mostly internal. So then how would people get the information if the newsletter is only for the organization? Um, I think I'm a little confused by your question. I thought you oh, I'm asked. sorry. So maybe I'm not being clear. The newsletter is open to everyone at the University of Michigan, like anyone that's listening. Okay. Oh, so one of you is saying yes, and I think one of you is saying no. <laughs> Um, so we, oh, okay, actually, yes, let me backtrack. We do send out the newsletter um, to people who have indicated an interest in being an ally. So if you do have an interest in that, you can still email us, but the listserv is an internal list. Got it. Perfect. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, no, no. That's great to know. That's great to know. So we have a question. You mentioned that AAPI staff community has unique needs. What are those needs unique to staff that we should know about as a staff community? Everyone else. Oh, that's a, yeah, Steve, do you want to take it first? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so I would start with that the APIDA community uh, is an incredibly diverse community. Mm -hmm. uh, within the United States, there are over 60 ethnicity, ethnicities that are represented. Um, generationally, we have immigrants to fourth, fifth plus generations. We have a broad range of immigration stories from folks who were white recruited for um, you know, doctors and engineers who were recruited to refugees, to undocumented um, people. We have a broad range of socioeconomic diversity, edu educational attainment, um, faith, and religion diver faith and religious diversity as well. It is incredibly difficult to make any generalized statement about um, the APIDA community. So, um, being able to speak to the broad range of diversity within the PETA uh, is definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the one thing that I could say that's true for the community as a whole is that we are a racialized and minoritized community, right? And so we can definitely see examples of that uh, in, our, in our current environment. Um, East Asians, the quote unquote model minority who are uh, typically breaking the curve in your math and science classes to play on a stereotype, have quickly become the yellow peril. We're now bringing disease and death to the country, right? So as um, a PETA folks, our acceptance in this country has always is and has always been conditional, right? Uh, it's, we're, we're a convenient wedge when we want to say that, um, hey, look at the Asian community. They're doing all right. Why can't you other minoritized communities get it together? But when something hits the fan, then we become a target, an easy and quick, easy target. So um, all this is to say is uh, we have a lot of different diversities within our community and being able to address those, uh, the concerns of uh, new immigrants to the country, to folks who have been here for a generation or two or plus, being able to speak to uh, all of those concerns is definitely a challenge. Thinking about 
um, the you know uh, historical uh, conflicts that have happened between um, the different countries that are represented in our community and being able to navigate and address those is is also um, particularly uh, a challenge um, and something that needs to be considered as well. So. Um, that's a really big picture answer that doesn't necessarily answer the specifics relative to staff, um, but hopefully that can set a framework in thinking about uh, how our community is, might be different than how we typically think about um, minoritized communities. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Amanda? Yeah, I can jump in here. So I briefly mentioned that one of the professional development workshops we offered was about the bamboo ceiling. And so it's the understanding that for a PETA staff, um, advancement into leadership and higher positions has been really difficult at the University of Michigan and in general. And so that's something that we are really looking at, um, talking to staff and hearing their stories about feeling like they're being passed up for promotional opportunities, professional development, things like that, um, whether it's because they've been sort of boxed in, as Steve said, as like this model minority figure who, you know, is going to be pretty quiet and not make a lot of waves or just not being seen as a leader because there's some cultural differences, right? Like um, a lot of Asian cultures are much more um, collectivist. And so talking about the, um, accomplishments and things is always with a we framework rather than in Western culture, we're talking about people's accomplishments are more I forward. And so maybe it's a matter of helping our staff understand how they can better advocate for themselves for these positions and advancement opportunities. There's also general staff issues that um, would separate us from faculty and students. So um, being able to have support from supervisors and from workplaces in order to be able to participate in these events. Um, not all staff have equal opportunity to participate in volunteer activities for like us. So getting mm -hmm. information to staff can be more challenging at times. That is great. You both speak to such important things. And Steve, I appreciate you talking about the diversity in all of our marginalized communities instead of thinking of them as one thing right so it's so much diversity in each one and um amanda i appreciate you talking about specific needs to staff who sometimes feel like their voice is not heard as much as faculty or students so that's great i like the professional development opportunities a lot and i think that's that should be very helpful for the community we have one question about international students asian international students and how does the task force speak to the needs of those who are um, Asian students that are international as well, if you do. Yeah, sure. So I believe we did have a representative from GRIN, which I, I believe uh, represents international graduate students, uh, join the task force to uh, see what's going on and to uh, lend a voice to, to that. Um, I would say that, um, anti-Asian, the current environment for anti-Asian violence doesn't check your generation. Nobody asks, were you born here before, you know, dropping the hate hammer <laughs> to, to um, mm -hmm. put it inappropriately lightly. Um, so yes, I would say that the work that we're doing to address anti-Asian hate on uh, at University of Michigan uh, cuts across generation, cuts across whether or not you identify as an American. I think the, in these times, um, this kind of virulent anti-Asian racism doesn't distinguish uh, whether or not you've been here a generation or two or a recent immigrant. Thank you. And yeah, Mary actually also posted GRIN, the Graduate Rackham International. We, our conversation last week was with GRIN and we'll send out um, the resources that they provided as well of things that were specific to international graduate students. Um, we have a question. How can non-AAPI people create space for AAPI to speak out about these issues without taking away the voice of AAPI people or centering the narrative on the person trying to help who is not a member of the community. We get this question a lot um, from scholars that are just asking, okay, if we are in a privileged community, how can we help without like taking space away from you? What is the most appropriate ways or some of the appropriate ways that you feel that they could do that? 
Sure. So an example that I would give um, is uh, most recently we have uh, a community member uh, is involved with a community organization um, that is focused on building uh, broad coalitions of folks interested in social justice issues. A visitor to the organization was like, well, uh, they're a PETA identified and they were like, I, I don't see myself represented here, but I like your mission, but I'm hoping also to see more uh, folks like me speaking to issues that are important to me. Uh, and so the leadership, um, which were not a PETA, were like, well, yeah, we need to respond to this. This is a voice that we haven't uh, included and haven't thought about. And so they reached out to um, one of the core team members to say, hey, we know y'all are engaged with these issues. Um, is there any way that you all, we could bring you all into um, one of our meetings to talk to these issues um, and help build connections within our community and organization so that we can have more represent representation, not only uh, within membership, but hopefully, you know, in terms of folks bringing up issues, maybe uh, stepping up into leadership roles. Um, so um, I think bringing, building connections with folks who are engaged with the issues, inviting them into spaces, making space for um, those voices uh, is, is a piece of that. And that's an example that um, has happened recently. I would agree. I think this webinar is a good example of that. Um, oftentimes our staff group feels like we have to create the space to be able to share these things because nobody has invited us into other places that already exist. So I think if you're in a position of power where you have this kind of platform to be able to share someone else's experience or learn from them, that's a great opportunity. So I think just reaching out to people and asking how they're doing and asking if they want to be able to share their story. I love that. I love that. You're right. And we all can do that. And that was one my next question is basically like a on your a personal, your personal leadership journey. What was it um, that was a burning kind of passion in you that actually said, I'm going to be a leader in this space? We get that question a lot. Like there's a lot that I want to do. Um, what should I do? How should I do? What was it that, that made you say, I'm taking a step forward? Amanda, do you want to go first? So Steve and I have very different journeys, which I think is helpful. Um, yeah. So just a little quick background for me. So like I'm from originally from New Jersey and was born in a predominantly white area. So thinking about my Chinese American identity really didn't um, become a prevalent like force or things that I identified with until I got to graduate school um, because I was raised in mostly predominantly white spaces. And so my main goal was just to assimilate and blend in and like not rock the boat because I was you know experiencing racism both at a micro and macro level and just wanted to fit in as a kid. Um, but when I came to the University of Michigan, it was the most diverse cohort I had ever experienced. Um, and I got my graduate degree in higher education through the Center for um, the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Ed here. And I was really excited about the fact that there were so many people who looked different than me, had different experiences. And I realized that um, being able to talk about those things was okay. And so my like pivotal moment was when I went to a professional um, development conference through one of the higher education associations. And there was a panel of speakers who were all APIDA identifying staff talking about their experiences. And it was like such a life-changing moment for me to see so many people who looked like me talking about their work in this field. And it was the first time I realized that I could bring my whole self to the role. And so that's what helped me, you know, start putting myself out there into these spaces. Um, I always joke with the core team that I kind of just like fell into this position. Um, I was really just hoping to like plan social events and um, do a lot of the administrative tasks behind the scene. But I think as I got more comfortable with the core team and learned from so many of our members, got more comfortable speaking out about these things. Man, has been pivotal <laughs> in, in the core team. Um, yeah, and so uh, my story is that uh, I was born in a small, uh, was born in Chicago, but grew up in a small town in Ohio. Um, and um, as you might imagine, uh, you know, small town in Ohio wasn't particularly uh, diverse. I was one of two Asian Americans in my school growing up. And so I experienced my own fair share of racism. Um, and similar to Amanda, like my goal uh, at that point was just to blend in and kind of make myself as small as possible because the only time I seemed to get noticed uh, for my physical appearance was negative. Uh, it wasn't until I got to college and I actually took my first Asian American studies class, I found 
the connections between my personal experiences growing up to what had been, um, you know, U.S. policy um, and history that had shaped my experiences in the present. So this idea of the of the Asian Americans being a perpetual foreigner is completely related to the immigration laws that banned immigration from Asia for a good 50, 60 uh, years. And so when people ask me, where are you really from? Or, oh, your English is really good. Like that's where that's coming from. And that's not just my own personal experience, but has uh, a, a string connected to the past. And this idea of the model minority, oh, you must be doing fine. You must be great at math. I'm horrible at math. <laughs> um, was related to you know the preferential uh, immigration status that were given to white collar professionals, the doctors, the the engineers that helped shape this kind of stereotype that exists in the the larger popular imagination. So, classwork really uh, helped me make sense of my place in the world and give me a connection to a history that I didn't have an opportunity to learn about in high school or junior high growing up and. In addition to that, I you know, sought out and found a larger APITA community who had similar experiences that I had had growing up. And so starting to understand my experiences both as individual and institutional historical uh, products, I began to think about um, what are the dynamics that I have experienced and how are these dynamics playing out for other minoritized communities as well. As well. And so it was in college that I really uh, started to embrace my ethnic and racial identity and build communities uh, with folks who are also engaged in similar social justice conversations. Um, and so from there, I really wanted to provide similar transformative experiences for students. And so I've uh, dedicated my career to doing um, that type of work primarily uh, in the not-for-profit and higher education spaces. Um, and so I've, I've worked in a number of different not-for-profits as well as uh, more recently transitioned to student affairs um, maybe uh, eight to 10 years ago. So higher ed is actually something relatively new in my career path, but that's kind of what has led me um, on this career path. And uh, I was in uh, California working at UCLA before coming to Michigan and I knew when I got to Michigan that the, the diversity here is a little bit different and so immediately I sought out a PETA and actually uh, Amanda was the first person I met at the uh, a mixer that they held for a PETA staff and so the as they say the rest is history I got connected to the organization and the opportunity came up to step into a leadership role and I was looking for uh, deeper connections and more community and connections to um, some of Peter's staff. And here we are. Yeah. It's great to hear that your stories are so different. And you know? <laughs> it's good to hear that. And that a lot of students and a lot of scholars think their role or the job that they're actually trying to get doesn't have the word diversity in it or it's not a diversity role. And then they wonder if there's no other way to go about it. And you both demonstrated because neither of your titles are technically those that say that you are doing diversity work per se, correct or no? That's correct, yeah. Steve does um, assessment for the first year experience and I work with the living learning community. Yeah, so just seeking those opportunities in any environment, whatever you do, right? Um, our goal is to inspire, inform, and but motivate people to action as well. And so this aligns a lot with our question that's next. What is the call of action would you like to give to the U of M community? So I have two thoughts on this. Um, my first is to like check in on your friends and colleagues who are PETA identifying. Um, as Steve mentioned, like the mental calculation that takes place every day because of our fear of safety, like for fear of safety and health right now is, is pretty large. And so I think just even asking like, how are you doing? What can I do to support you is a huge step in not feeling as isolated, especially as many, many of us work from home right now. Um, I think the other thing is that there's so many resources available, especially because we're at the end of Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And so there are lots of articles, lots of curated lists of readings, podcasts, films, et cetera, created by, by Asian and Asian Americans. And so just do some Googling, do some research and see, you know, how you can get involved and learn about more um, things cultivated by the community. And I would add, uh, we've already mentioned the bystander training a, a couple times and I'll plug it again that this is not, uh, while 
um, a PETA folks would definitely um, gain from that. It is a training that is for everybody. And these mm -hmm. bystander intervention skills not only uh, are, are relevant to this current moment, but also in, in life, uh, generally speaking as well. Um, so I would encourage folks to, to, if you're not familiar with bystander intervention skills, to check out that training and um, to intervene in, in events that particular to this moment, if you're experiencing or seeing anti-Asian um, rhetoric, hate uh, acts happening that you intervene. Um, uh, having grown up, you know, one of few Asian Americans uh, in a town where I felt like I had to deal with racism all by myself, it was a lonely feeling. Um, and uh, for me now, uh, having the staff community is definitely uh, a big piece in, in knowing that I'm not alone and seeing other folks engaged in, in you know, as Amanda said, reaching out, checking in, uh, intervening on the behalf of folks, of strangers, um, is will do a, will go a long way in terms of uh, helping us all get through this challenging time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the other questions is, this work can be incredibly rewarding. We know this, and this is why we do this work. However, it can be challenging at times. So the question is, what are some of the challenges you personally as a leader in this space face, and what are the things you do for self-care and to approach those challenges? I think for me, it can sometimes, it can be the influx of information, especially in the work from home environment, right? You get lots of more emails, lots more G chats or texts or things. And sometimes it can be hard to sift through all of that and process, especially when the information is emotionally challenging. Um, there's also so many news articles right now, right? About like hate crimes that are occurring. And in some ways you wanna know what's happening, but you also don't wanna know because it's mm -hmm. scary. Um, and so for me, it's allowing myself um, a couple of hours each day to turn off the phone, turn off the news, right? Only looking at the news once a day rather than, you know, constantly refreshing my feeds, um, just allowing myself space to step away from some of it because it can be really hard. I would second that as well as the balance between uh, wanting to do the work uh, related to APITA, but APITA doesn't cut my paycheck, unfortunately. <laughs> so trying to balance the, my passion with APITA with my day-to-day -day work. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and as well as, you know, in the work from home environment, the, the family uh, responsibilities and obligations that I have on the day to day, trying to balance all those things has definitely been uh, one of the challenges. Um, in terms of self care, um, I, I deleted my Twitter account for a couple weeks when I needed a break. I'm back on it. Can't, can't get enough, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, taking a break from social media has definitely been a piece for me. Uh, now that the weather's warming up, just getting out, uh, doing yard work, funny enough, as a person who, uh, you know, had been living in California, didn't have a yard at all, and initially really uh, was resenting my yard. I found it to be a space, you know, a couple hours where I can just kind of zone out and cultivate something that I can, you know, immediately see results in. I pulled out a weed, it's gone now, right? So, um, yeah, finding things that, uh, have some sort of media gratification. Uh, yard work for me has been that. Great, so we just have a couple more questions. One is, what advice would you give to people that aspire to do the type of work that you do or to be leaders in this? Do you, do you wanna go first? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I would say I have had a long and windy path. Uh, and I would say that is nothing that I have pre-planned out. My life, what I wanted my life to be at 18 is completely different than what it is at the moment. So all that to say is um, what has been held true in my life and has brought me to where I am today has been just taking on opportunities, showing up in, in random places for random events, um, connecting with people from different communities, uh, taking opportunities to build a broad range of skill sets, um, building coalition with folks and, and not being afraid to kind of jump in the fray. Uh, leadership, uh, I've done a lot of work around uh, supporting leadership development for students and I found it personally rewarding for myself and have come to realize that leadership's not a destination. You don't 
cross a line and then you can be a leader. It's something that we all have the capacity for and it's a matter of uh, finding what our gifts and skills are and highlighting those and building on those and finding uh, a trusted and loved community that can give you feedback that can say, hey, maybe this could be something you can work on and here's an opportunity where you could do that. Um, so just jumping in the fray, taking risks and, and learning along the way, I think is uh, something that has held true for me. I would echo similar sentiments. I think it's just showing up. Um, I have definitely never viewed myself as a leader in any sort of in any of these capacities. You know, when I first started gathering people for these meetings, I felt like the way that I could contribute was to send out Google Calendar invites and um, help with the running agenda and take attendance, right? But like, those are things that still helped us keep moving. And so it's whatever your strengths and skills are at the time, like just see how they can fit in and contribute. So before we ask the last question, is there anything we didn't ask? Anything that you want to share that hasn't been asked? or anything that you want to say that hasn't been said? I don't think so. So then our final question is, what's your message to the world right now? It's a big I question. It is. <laughs> This may feel like a cop out, but I think it's going to be what I just said. Like it's just showing up, right? There's so much happening right now with marginalized um, folks of color, right? There's a there's a lot in the news. There's a lot on social media about what's happening, and there's there's just a lot. And it's a lot. It may be a lot to process, and it may be hard to lean into. But like, just figure out what way you can show up to be to like show your support for those folks who are hurting, right? Whether it's a small action such as signing a petition or something more more like showing up for a protest or um, donating money to a small business, right? Like just doing something to show your support. Yeah, yeah I, I don't have much outside of trite kind of phrases, but you know, we're all in this together. Um, so uh, echoing the, uh, the, the hope and call for action and, and supporting um, your APETA community, friends, family, um, people in your neighborhood, uh, that being a piece of it, um, but also uh, recognizing that they're contrary to popular imagination around the APETA community, that uh, there are folks in the community that are aware of and invested and care about um, other things that are going on in the community. Um, what's going on in Minneapolis, uh, what's going on in Louisville, um, those are all things that um, are deeply uh, saddening and concerning to, to me and folks on the core team as well. So I uh, know that um, it's my aspiration to stand in solidarity as well and that um, hopefully we can help build those bridges so that we can make a better world that we can all live in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Frank, Frederick Douglass said a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And, um, and so I agree with you. I just want right now to thank you both for stepping up and standing up and leaning in and, and taking on this leadership role. And I learned an incredible um, amount from just the resources you shared. I appreciated hearing your stories and reading your stories. And I think it's so important that we continue to do that. Thank you both for being here today. And thank you all who joined us. And we will send out the resources to everyone who joined. With that, I want to say everyone take care of yourselves and others, um, like our panelists, our special guests said today. And um, have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, y'all. Mm -hmm. Yes.